Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Forest Lake Presbyterian Church. Today we will be reading from Romans the eighth chapter. And before I do that, uh, this is for Sunday, July the 19th, in the year of our Lord 2020. And the title of the sermon is Family Resemblance. Last week here at Forest Lake Presbyterian Church, we read the first part of Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. And in that chapter, Paul describes two completely different paths or two different ways of living. He tells us that we are made for the purpose of loving God and loving self and loving neighbors, and that when we live in the way that God intends, which he describes as living in the spirit of Christ, that when we live that way, we are given life and freedom and joy and peace. But he says that often people don't choose to live according to that path. Often people choose to live according to a self-centered path, serving themselves instead of God's purpose. And that path, Paul says, leads to death. So he lays out before us in the eighth chapter a choice that each one of us must make. If we live selfishly, he says, we are actually choosing death. But if we choose God-centered lives, then we choose and we accept, we receive, we allow God to give us life and love and peace. So today's passage, Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 25, picks up right where last week's left off. And the Apostle Paul assumes that he is writing to those who have chosen to walk the path after the example of Christ, the path that leads to life. And so Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 12, I'm reading from the contemporary English Bible version. Paul writes, so then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it isn't an obligation to ourselves to live our lives on the basis of selfishness. If you live on the basis of selfishness, you're going to die. But if you put to death the actions of the body with the spirit, you will live. All who are led by God's spirit are God's sons and daughters. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to lead you back again into fear, but you received a spirit that shows you are adopted as his children. With this spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The same spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. But if we are children, we are also heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ if we really suffer with him so that we can also be glorified with him. I believe that the present suffering is nothing compared to the coming glory that is going to be revealed to us. The whole creation waits breathless with anticipation for the revelation of God's sons and daughters. Creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, it was the choice of the one who subjected it, but subjected in hope that the creation itself will be set free from slavery to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of God's children. We know that the whole creation is groaning together and suffering labor pains up until now. And it's not only the creation, we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first crop of the harvest, also groan inside as we wait to be adopted and for our bodies to be set free. We were saved in hope. If we see what we hope for, that isn't hope. Who hopes for what they already see? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So once we have decided to accept God's love, let go of everything else in order to be able to take hold of our status as children of God, then what? Well, in this next section in Romans chapter eight, Paul 
speaks to us and anticipates our questions, then what? Once we've allowed God to give us life, now what happens? If God loves us, Paul says, and we are God's children, we are also heirs with Christ. We're not slaves, we're not second class, we are heirs with Christ. And so if we are doing our best to live a life centered on God instead of on self, then Paul knows our next question. Then why do we not feel more loved? Why is this life so hard? Why are we suffering? Why is the world broken? Why does violence and crime violate our own lives? Why are we afraid for the future? If all of that is true, then why can we not find a job? Why can we not get a cure? Why can we not have a baby? Why can we not find a spouse? Why can we not be free of pain? If God is real and if God is love, then why is there so much suffering? If we live according to the gifts and the grace of God as sons and daughters of God, if we're indeed equal to Christ as heirs of the kingdom, then what is it with this virus? Why is life not easier? If this is what it means to be adopted into God's family, then honestly, some of us are ready to look for some new parents. I saw a sign the other day that said, I wanted zombies. This virus sucks. Life is difficult. Life is hard. It is very tempting to go in search of some other God who might produce better results or at least quicker results. Though I think we've often overlooked this remarkable piece of truth in advertising that shows up in Romans chapter eight, Paul here says to us very clearly that to be a part of God's family means not just sharing the name of Christian, not just sharing in the joy, the life, and the promise. Paul says, without a doubt, that being adopted as God's own children also means that we will suffer in this world. Verse 17 says, we are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ if, if we really suffer with him so that we can also be glorified with him. If our family resemblance is limited only to sharing Christ's name, if we call ourselves Christian, but we do not live like Christ, love like Christ, forgive like Christ, suffer like Christ, then we show that we have not accepted the offer to become God's own children. We have instead chosen to become a part of the family that encourages us and calls us to seek ease and power and privilege and excess and instant relief from pain. That's what we call addiction. You know what? We may not look, we, we may actually look like our earthly parents. We may look a lot like our parents, but we are only their child when we love, trust, respect, and seek to serve them and are willing to suffer because of the relationship that we bear, the love that we hold for them. And so Paul speaks to the heart of what it really means to be a part of the family of God, to be a child of God. This last Wednesday here at Forest Lake Presbyterian Church, about 40 or 50 of us gathered in the parking lot to listen and to sing along as Charles Huff and Sylvia Tremere played Sylvia on the keyboard and Charles on his banjo, old hymns and gospel favorites. And we sang some old time hymns that I haven't sung in a long time, like this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And we sang, will the circle be unbroken? And we sang the old rugged cross, which I had not sung for years. And it struck me as I sang the words to the old rugged cross and the other old hymns, that all of those old hymns assume 
hard times and suffering. When we sing the old rugged cross, these are the words that we sing. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And then we sing later on in another verse, to the old rugged cross I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to that old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. It appears to me that we have moved from being willing to bear shame, reproach, and suffering and pain to a place where we demand our rights, resent inconvenience, and expect no pain and suffering. The crosses we bear, the crosses we wear, are often smooth and gold, not rugged and bloodstained. When we are sons and daughters of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We not only look like God because we are made in the image of God, but we are also to look like God, our parent, in how we live, in how we love, and in how we suffer. Because if the family resemblance only extends to belonging to the right church or wearing the right jewelry, then we have not yet accepted our right place as a fellow heir with Christ, our place at the table. To be sons and daughters of God means that we are loved, claimed, saved, beyond a doubt, and without any deserving on our part. To be the sons and daughters of God means that God gives us life, love, joy, peace. To be sons and daughters of God means that we have decided to let go of fear and anxiety and worry, all the stuff that the world tries to give us at every single turn. We refuse that in order to be able to accept what God gives. And to be sons and daughters of God also means that we become willing to suffer as Christ suffered. And unless we are willing to suffer, Paul says we cannot be heirs with Christ. To be sons and daughters of God means that the American church has got to be ready to give up our privilege, our power, and our ease to serve God's family and to serve God's purpose. Are we really ready to be sons and daughters of God and heirs with Christ? <laughs> Are we ready? And I don't know about you, but the little voices in my head and our heads, I think, say to us, you know, but mm, my friends on Facebook are living the good life. They're having fun. They're visiting beautiful places. They go places where waiters bring them drinks with little umbrellas in them. Don't I deserve that too? I wanna to be part of that family. It doesn't look like much fun to suffer. A lot of people look like they aren't suffering. Why would I have to suffer? And when that voice starts to talk to us in our hearts and minds, that's the point at which we find ourselves at the fork in the road that Paul has so wonderfully described in Romans. There really are two paths out in front of us. One path appears easy and wide, is full of beautiful destinations and little drinks with umbrellas in them, nice cars and the power and influence to be able to avoid inconvenience. That path Paul describes as selfishness and serving ourselves. That path, Paul says, leads only to death. And true life is not found 
in avoiding pain or in cushioning ourselves with excess. The other path that Paul describes is more daunting. On that path, there is both pain and joy. There is both suffering and ease. There is service and groaning. That path Paul describes like labor pains, as if he knew. That's the path he says we're walking right now as children of God who have accepted our place in the family. We walk that path in the sure hope and the certain faith that that path leads to life, joy, peace, and the God who loves us unconditionally. He says it's like a mother who suffers in order to give birth to new life. That's how we're suffering right now so that life may also come to us. The end of that road, he says, it's not fully in sight. We can't totally see the end of that road yet. But what Paul does is he gives us a road map. And God has promised that we are made for what is found at the end of that road that is traveled by everybody who follows Jesus Christ. It's that path that is walked by everybody who has accepted the call to become a part of God's family, to become sons and daughters of God. Now, the people on both of those paths look like their parent. On both paths, people are made in the image of God. But for those on the path of selfishness and ego, sometimes that's where the family resemblance ends. Those on the path of the spirit of Christ are not only made in the image of God, we are supposed to be in the process of being able to think like, to love like, to forgive like, and to suffer like Christ. For those who claim to walk the path of Christ, the family resemblance is to go deep into our hearts and lives. It really is a choice that we make. It's not an easy choice. The voices of those who call us to ease and power and privilege and security, those voices are really strong and really present and really seductive, and their Facebook feeds are beautiful. But the end of that road, Paul says, is death. Death. We can't yet see the end of the road that involves serving God instead of self. But Paul, and I would venture to say, you know and I know, those who have gone ahead of us in the faith, who have walked the path that Christ has walked, those people assure us that the hope of life and joy and peace is certain because God is at the end of that path. And so because they are certain, we are saved in hope. We can't see the end fully but God has promised to take us home. We are promised that we will round the bend and see true life and no true love and be ready at that point then to accept our rightful place alongside Jesus as children, as sons and daughters, as heirs of a loving God. So, Paul asks us today, whose promises do we trust? To which family do we belong? Can others see the family resemblance? I wonder. Let us pray. A loving and giving God, speak to us in a voice that we cannot mistake and quiet the voices that call us to privilege and power and security apart from you. Prepare us to carry the suffering of this life after the example and teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has gone ahead of us so that we might have hope. 
Help us today to talk like, to give like, to serve like, to love like, and to suffer like those who are part of the family of God. Amen. Friends, go in peace. Amen.